I'm Matt Miller from the Google Teacher Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Coming up on episode 164 of the House of EdTech podcast, no need to adjust your speakers. I'm Derek Larson, and you're in good hands, as I have a sub-plan that includes an EdTech thought, a couple of EdTech recommendations, and a House of EdTech VIP. So, strike up the band. Welcome to the House of EdTech podcast. I am your host, Chris Nessie. The House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. I discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools, and I share tools and tips that you can hear today and use tomorrow. You're going to hear the stories of teachers, leaders, and creators just like you. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way you teach and how your students learn. Welcome to episode 164. If this is your first time listening, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. As I said in the intro, I'm not Chris Nessie, but this is the House of Ed Tech. You see, Chris is out on personal leave for a couple of shows, so I'll be your substitute for the next six episodes. I am Derek Larson. You can find me online as at Lars3EB. I am an educator by trade. I have 13 years in education. I spent seven years teaching fourth grade, one year teaching fifth grade, I then spent two years at a regional service center as the EdTech director, SEDC, here in Southwest Utah. I spent two years as a librarian at an intermediate school, which just dealt with sixth and seventh graders. And now I'm currently at a middle school, still as a librarian, super excited for that position. So middle school in my district is eighth and ninth grade only. Some of you might think, hey, I've heard his voice before. Well, you might have. I've been a guest on the show four different times. Clear back to episode 22 in 2014, uh, back when I was a fourth grade teacher. Uh, Episode 67, I came back as I transitioned to become the EdTech director for SCDC. Episode 90, I was on with the ISTE 17 recap with my good friend Jen Giffen, uh, virtual GIF online. And episode 106 at the USET 18 recap and talking about hosting a conference it was a fantastic trip. That was when Chris came out to Utah for USET 18, 2018. Thanks to Kite Learning for that opportunity. Honestly, that was so amazing to get to have Chris in my home state. I've also been on the show six times in the different SmackDown episodes. I was in 20, episode 26 in 2014, episode 51 in 2015, episode 76 in 2016, episode 99 in 2017, episode 124 in 2018, Episode 147 in 2019. And I've had a few other little throw-in spots. Episode 43, Dog Days of Summer. I kind of came in talking about password management, something that I'm very passionate about. Back in 2015, when Chris jumped back to the future on the Blab Show, I was on part of that. That was a lot of fun. And episode 111, Growing Your Ed Tech Skills During Summer, back in 2018. That was a fun episode as well. Now, I'm super excited to be here for what I hope is an enjoyable show today that's enough to bring you back for wanting more, I think I've done a good job. Before we get into any of the the meat and potatoes, if you will, there is an announcement. The House of Ed Tech is now available on Amazon Music. If you are an Amazon Music user, they've just added podcasts and House of Ed Tech is available. You can go to chrisnessy.com slash Amazon Music on your computer, your phone, or just talk to your Amazon device of your choice. Ask them to play House of Ed Tech. Get out there, check it out. If you do, leave a review, some comments, and let Chris know that you did. Awesome. Well, let's get ready to jump right into the EdTech Thought and our featured content of the show. It's been a rough year, I'm sure. Some of you, most of you, were probably thinking the same thing. Hey, this has been a hard year. It's been a very different year than normal. So one of the things I like to do is I like to move around on Twitter and 
and learn from my fellow teachers, see what they're going through, see what's going on. How can I help? How can I learn? How can I improve? And I came across a tweet from the account at Teacher Goals that said, great advice had an image shared, like one of those black little blackboards with the letters that said, if you get tired, learn to rest, not quit. And I thought, that's a great thought. I, th- I felt like it was very fitting. I think a lot of times we do get tired. And sometimes when we get tired, we think, man, I just, I can't do this anymore. And I really liked that what it was pointing out was saying, learn to rest, take a break, take a rest, don't quit. Shortly thereafter, I came across another tweet, um, this one by John Gordon, being positive doesn't mean you ignore the reality or the situation or sugarcoat what's happening. It means you don't let negativity sour things and make them worse. You know, this this tweet, I don't follow John, John himself, but I follow my good friend, Stacy Lindis, who is online at, on Twitter as at Stacy Lindis. Previously, she was at I Run Tech, so maybe you, maybe you do follow her. I wasn't aware of this. The change changed over the summer, but Stacy shared that out, and I really thought, you know, that's that's important to realize that I always do try to be positive in what I'm saying. I try to be positive and put a good spin on things. If nothing else, for myself, helps me to to not stay so negative and so so fighting against other people. And I like to have that positive outlook, but I really like this this thought by John Gordon, being positive doesn't mean you ignore the reality of the situation or sugarcoat what's happening. It means you don't let negativity sour things and make them worse. You know, there's a lot of crazy going on, a lot of funky, a lot of bad stuff, a lot of disparaging stuff. I think a lot of times we as educators, we see it firsthand and we see it in ways that people, other people don't think about because we see it on kids' faces and how they're reacting and how they're handling. It makes a lot of things a lot harder. And so I like this point that, you know what, you can be positive, but that doesn't mean you're ignoring. Because I think sometimes people online like to fight with you and say, oh, you're just trying to, you're just pretending like nothing's going on. You're putting your head in the sand. And I don't think that's what's happening. I like that, that quote. Just a couple days ago, I came across another tweet, this one by Kellyanne. She goes by at inner underscore moonlight. She's a special ed teacher. And she shared a tweet that made me think a little more still. It said, please don't tell educators to take time for themselves unless this statement is leading to or preceded by taking something off their plate or helping them to accomplish this in some way. And she kind of went on to say, you know, a lot of people were kind of coming back at her and retweeting her and replying saying, but really take time. You need to take time for yourself. And she said, I'm not saying we aren't or shouldn't. I'm just saying it's not helpful and it can come off as diminishing the problem. As educators, we always have a lot on our plate. And this year, it seems like there's even more on our plate. More is being thrown at us because we're basically told, hey, plan for X, Y, and Z. Oh, and all the other 23 letters of the alphabet. Let's have 26, 30 different plans going at once because we don't fully know what's going on. And I absolutely agree with this. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, let's take some time, but don't be telling other teachers how to do it because for some of us, and I'm one of those people, the best thing to do when I'm getting kind of burnt out and I've got things going on, sometimes it's better for me to just push through and finish something up and put a bow on a few things and just know that, hey, I'm done. I have finished. I've accomplished this piece. Let's move on. Now I can actually rest and relax. And sometimes that means I look like I'm more stressed and more crazy than I need to be. But that's what it takes for me to calm down. Kelly shared a great graphic as well, talking about toxic positivity, where people might say, hey, stop being so negative. But the validation should be it's pretty normal to have some negativity in this situation. Again, going back to John Gordon's thought, his tweet that he shared, being positive doesn't mean you ignore the reality of the situation or you're not sugarcoating it. I think it's important that we do take the time to recognize that if somebody has to vent for a minute, that doesn't mean that they're just terrible and nasty and always negative. Maybe they just need to vent for a minute, you know? A good friend of mine, Amy Storer, jumped onto Kellyanne's tweet and shared something that I thought was really important. She said, 
You know, it's right. And acknowledge that how we self-care is personal to us. There should never be a prescribed way to self-care. When I see lists of ways to self-care, it makes my eyes twitch. Kellyanne sent back and said, hey, I see, I same, I see it really minimized. Just like go do a five-minute meditation and then get back to the chaos. You know, that doesn't work for everybody. For some people, maybe for you, it does work. Say, so you know what? I'm going to step away. I'm going to do some yoga, do some meditation, and you're going to come back reju- re- rejuvenated. Some of us, that doesn't work for. You know, and Amy says again, it's true. Sim- it, it truly isn't that simple. She says, what I need is what I need. For me, it's music, concerts, books, my niece and nephew. For others, it might be running five miles and leaving work on time. I don't leave work on time, and I shouldn't be made to feel bad about it. And that that last part really got me because I'm a night person. I'm not the first person into my school building, hardly ever. In fact, never. But I'm often the last one out, and I'm not patting myself on the back. But what I'm saying is I work better in the afternoon. I'm often there an hour or two after contract time, not because I'm Superman getting stuff done and I'm saving all the things, but because that's when I work the best. And I don't want people coming at me and saying, oh my gosh, you're terrible. You can't get out on time. You can't leave. Contract time is here and you're staying past this. Who cares? If your thing is to get there, get to school an hour, two, three hours early, because that's when you can work it, work the best and get your stuff done, you, you do it. But if you need to, if you're like me and you're more of a later in the day kind of a person, go for it. We should never have to feel bad about how we prepare and how we work. And I really found these couple of tweets super helpful and super powerful. They just seem to really hit me. I mean, we're all going through some really rough times, but yet we shouldn't be made to feel bad how we handle it if we're handling it the way we know best. And so my whole thing is this. Let's all just take a few extra minutes and try to be kind out there and just say, you know what? It's okay. I don't have to do it like you. You don't have to do it like me. We don't have to do it like somebody else. We are all different people. It's totally fine. I love the hashtag better together because I really feel like as people, as a society, as educators, we are truly better when we come together. And if we can stop dividing ourselves and infighting and, and this and that, I think we're better for it. But again, there's nothing wrong with being positive. We're not sugarcoating, as John Gordon said. I, I keep going back to that because that, that really stuck with me. But there's nothing wrong with looking for that positive and finding it. It doesn't mean that we're just, like I said, sugarcoating it. We're doing what works for us. And maybe that, maybe that doesn't work for you. And that's okay. But I guess the whole point of my my thought here is let's just be kinder online. We're all dealing with a lot of crazy, a lot of tough situations right now specifically. Let's take the time and really help ourselves to be better. That is my EdTech thought. We actually have two EdTech recommendations for today. The first one is going to sound like I'm going against what I just barely said. But the first recommendation I have is the power button of your device. Turn it off. Step away from the tech. Honestly, take some time away. So many of us are having to be in front of a device so much more than normal. I know most teachers that I I know in the classrooms in years past, they were hardly ever at their computer during the school day. They were up, they were in front of their kids, they were working, they were sharing, and that helped to give them energy and liveliness and and the ability to do what they needed to do. But so many of us are remote teaching, are either fully online or doing a hybrid model where we're in front of a computer way more this year than we have been in years past. If you're starting to feel sore, if you're starting to feel tired, Take the necessary steps. And if that means turning off the device and and getting away from it, please do that if that works for you. Like I said previously, I'm I'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. This is my recommendation is find a way to get away from the technology. 
if nothing else, if you really can't, try to follow the 20-20-20 rule. Now, if you haven't heard of this, this is super easy and it's super helpful. Our eyes are not meant to look at a screen so long. What eye people, optometrists, doctors, eye doctors have said is every 20 minutes, you should look at something that is 20 feet away for 20 seconds. That's the 2020 rule. I'll have a link to this on the show notes. But the reason for that is it takes about 20 seconds for your eyes to reset. And so they say every 20 minutes, so they want you to look away at something that's 20 feet away from where you're sitting and focus on that. It helped to reset your eyes. And I think a step further than that would be to get up from your chair, maybe kind of stretch around, go just walk around. If you can do that, walk around your office, walk around your house. If you're at a school building, walk around your classroom, give yourself that chance as well. I know this is so hard because we're doing what we can do. But remember, if you don't have anything left in your tank, you can't give that back to your students. So whatever it takes for you, whether that's concerts and and being with nieces and nephews like like my, like Amy, do what you have to do. If that's plugging through and getting stuff done, maybe you plug through and you push through and, and you really work hard so that way you can literally close the computer, step away and be done for a couple of hours for the weekend, you know, for a day, whatever it is, do what you have to. Uh, back in 2014, I wrote a post on my website, edtechbabble.net, called Analog Love. Now, the site's kind of been untouched for a couple of years. I need, I need to re kind of revamp it and kind of get going again. But that one post is, that's my most popular post to date. I'm, I'm blown away by the numbers. It doesn't make any sense. But in that post, I wrote about going to my wife's family's cabin up on Cedar Mountain. Now this is a cabin cabin. This is not like a fancy house. This is this is there's the amenities are, are are minuscule. I mean we drive up there. What's funny is it's only fifteen minutes from my in law's house. It's so close and they live in the middle of town. But it's it's up, it's remote in the sense that there is power. There are power lines that go into it. Uh, but all the outlets are two prong. There's no third prong. So I mean we're talking old. Um the running water has to be put in every year, um, and it's kind of a whole big mess, but there's no internet, there's no telephone, and it is amazing. It's, it, it makes me like nervous. I, I kind of jittery for the first six to eight hours when I'm up there because I feel like I just like jittery. I, I got to have my stuff. But what's amazing is after that t- sets in, I love it. We go. We try to go up at least once a summer, and our favorite thing to do is take books the good old dead tree variety and just sit and read. And my kids are starting to love reading as well, which is amazing. My oldest daughter, she, she loves the idea of, of us going up and just reading all day. My two younger kids are a little, little more wild, a little more energetic. They're not quite to that level, but we like to just go and get away, go hike around, go maneuver up, jump rocks down the stream but get away from the tech. I tell you what, it's hard to do because I know there's so many things that on my mind that I need to get accomplished. But breaking free, hitting that power button is amazing. If that works for you and if that will help you, do it. If not, find some way to help yourself. Take care of you so that you can be energized. Okay, that's number one. Here's my second, the second ed tech recommendation. It's actually a website I just found called Two Screens for Teachers, and it's at twoscreensforteachers.org. Now, these guys are a Seattle-based nonprofit trying to help teachers receive a second monitor to help them as they are teaching remotely, okay? The guy who started it was impressed because his friend bought his his mom, I believe, his mom a, a second monitor. He wanted to make sure she had what she needed to teach. And I think, how amazing, you know, Why a second screen? Well, New York Times has an article saying that it can improve online productivity 20 to 30 percent. But just just think about what you're doing trying to teach online. You've got everything on the screen. You've got your your video call, your slide deck. You've got your class notes. And how big is your your screen? Maybe you're on a 13 inch laptop. Not enough room. 
having a second monitor can really help you. Right now, I'm literally using two monitors, and I think a second monitor, it's so productive, so nice, because you can have all your information on one spot and everything else where it needs to be. If you are in need of a second monitor, go put your name on a waiting list, because how this works is teachers can go to this site, again, to number two or word two TWO screens for teachers.org and teachers can request a monitor. Now they they've had so many people try to get in there. There's a waiting list, but put your name down there, fill it out. They're also looking for people who are, who could be donors to help buy these screens. Now they're not getting super fancy. They're buying, I believe it's a 23 inch computer screen, nothing super, super fancy, but why that size? Well, it's a good size, but also that second monitor helps. It will help teachers to really make a difference. And frankly, for a 20, a 23-inch monitor, they're saying it really isn't too bad, um, like 150 bucks or so. So if you're interested, you can certainly reach out to this company, and you can either donate or you can request to receive a monitor. So if you fit either one of those categories, go for it. And let's see if we can help help some people out. And if you're one of those teachers that needs a second monitor, maybe this is going to help you. All right. Now let's get ready to meet this episode's House of EdTech VIP. Congratulations to this episode's House of EdTech VIP. Corey Henwood, that's C-O-R-Y-H-E-N-W-O-O-D. You can find Corey on Twitter at Corey Henwood or at his website, CoreyHenwood.com. He's got it figured out for branding. Look at that. Corey is a former math teacher and school principal. He is currently the innovation coordinator at Iron County School District in Cedar City, Utah. Corey is the founder of Launch High School, a new high-tech high school focused on entrepreneurship, design thinking, and personalized competency-based education. Corey is working to transform learning to become more empowering, personal, and relevant to student success in life. I've known Corey for many years, and he's an incredible educator who's very thoughtful, and he's not afraid to disrupt traditional education if he can see a way to help students learn and grow. I think you should totally go follow Corey on Twitter, again, at Corey Henwood, or at his website, CoreyHenwood.com. Corey's a great guy. I think you will enjoy learning from him, and he's a great one to connect to. So once again, congratulations to Corey. You are this episode's House of EdTech VIP. Hey, we made it. This is the end of the show. As a substitute teacher, I'm glad to have made it this far. I'm glad you're here with me. Thank you for checking out this episode of the House of EdTech. I really appreciate you being here, and I know Chris does too. Keep the conversation going. I would love to connect with you and hear your thoughts on the information and resources shared in this and every episode. For this episode, go to chrisnessie.com slash 164 or send me a message by going to chrisnessie.com slash feedback. You can connect with Chris and the House of Ed Tech on the socials at Mr. Nessie and at House of Ed Tech. If you'd like to reach me specifically, feel free to find me on any of the socials. I'm at large 3 eb pretty much everywhere. Now, if you enjoy the House of Ed Tech and you're still listening, so I have a pretty good hunch that you maybe do still enjoy the show. If you do, go tell somebody. Tell somebody in your building, share it online, whatever you do, tell somebody about the podcast. Leave a review at on Apple Podcasts. Tell people about it. If you share on social media, be sure to use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. Now, you can also become an awesome supporter, and many thanks go out to the following supporters. Mr. Anthony Arnault from the New Teacher Podcast, Dan Gallagher, Carlos Garza, Mr. G from the Ace Tech Podcast. Thanks, Peggy George, Jeff Herb, Mike Messner, JP Presavento from the Bits and Bytes of Education Podcast, Lori Simpson, 
and Kyle Wilcox. If you are interested in becoming an awesome supporter, go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. The next episode of the House of EdTech will be episode number 165. It will be released on October 4th, 2020. Hey, thanks so much for joining me again. I've had an absolute blast being here for my first of six weeks as a substitute teacher. Hopefully I get to hang out a little longer and share some more thoughts with you. Until next time, thank you for learning with me. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. Thank you.